Friday. What's up, folks? It is Friday Eve, Thursday night. For those who like to keep, like to keep track of the days a week, and there I go, and I already start with a fumble. I know that Ryan's already laughing in the background there because that's just the way things happen. And yesterday, if you guys tune in, by the way, I, again, I apologize sincerely because I didn't realize that obviously the mic wasn't on for the sports radio side, but the guests were on. So tonight I made sure that everything is good as my co-host reminded me, as my producer reminded me. So we are live on Sports Radio 102.9 FM, the game, also on Amp Radio and BroadStreetSouth.com along with YouTube. So four different ways you guys can watch and listen into the show. And tonight we have the privilege of having a Tennessee born right from Memphis, spend some time in Texas, but our speaker, brand strategist, photographer and traveler. And I'm dying to know as far as on the photography side, because a lot of people know that when we go out somewhere, I love taking tons of pictures. So Sandy Adams joins us tonight. Also the vice president of the Memphis rebounders, the booster club for the Memphis basketball team, the men's basketball team. So it's gonna be a lot of fun to talk to Sandy tonight and joining me, the cast of characters. And by that, I mean, Ryan, not Eric, because Eric is the ultimate professional. Yes. Ryan F is back again tonight. So we're going to have a lot of fun here this evening and the TBL playoffs also, so you guys can keep up, starts tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Of course, you can listen in on Sports Radio 102.9 FM, the game. You can watch the games on TBLTV.tv so that you don't miss a thing. The NBA draft is also going on tonight, and the Spurs kept their number one pick because there were rumors that it might have been they may have traded down, but thankfully, they kept the fans happy. So with all that being said, I'm Angel Martinez. It is episode 189. Sandy Adams once again joins us this evening. We can't wait to get the show started, so we will see you directly here on the other side. With the most, it is Ryan F. Ryan, how are you this evening? I'm Ryan F. It's great to be with everybody this weekend or this weekend. Well, yeah. It's it's Thursday it's here. the weekend, so we'll just say it's the weekend. It's nine o'clock on a Thursday night, and may I add, Sandy Adams, an award-winning photographer and brand strategist. I've got to throw that in there, and of course, we're gonna you know wax poetic about Memphis Tigers basketball, her photography, and what I need to do to strategize or strategize myself <laughs> on social media. All right, so I just. Keep that word strategize because I know you're going to screw me off the rest of the night with that word, <laughs> but that's okay. We understand, right? No problem. And the rest of the gang is here as well. Eric Mendel. And, and you know what, Eric, I figured out what your nickname is going to be. It's going to be easy. Easy. It, yep. First I initial, like it. last I initial. It. It'll make it super simple. So Eric is back with us tonight. Eric, thank you for joining us. Thank you uh, for having me once again. And I don't know if you mentioned this yet, uh, Angel or Ryan, but Sandy is also a book writer as well. I mean, she has a written book called The Success Blueprint as well that's available on Amazon. So if, Thank you for I, that. I don't know if you guys mentioned that either. But I did. No, not yet, but we're going to get around to it. But thank uh, you, Eric, for mentioning it because it's great <laughs> as always. But yes, you can pick up the book paperback on Amazon.com. Also, if you guys go to Sandy Adams underscore CO on Twitter, if you look on the link, it'll be in there on the campsite, the bio, click on the link and you'll get every single part of the information, including the Sandy Adams show, if I remember correctly, on the podcast. That's all right. Great amount of content. We'll get into that as well. But now welcoming Sandy Adams, our guest tonight. <laughs> Sandy, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. I can already tell. <laughs> yeah, well, as long as Ryan's around and he's still awake, that's a good thing. That, that's the fun part already started about five minutes ago. So that's a good thing. <laughs> but Phil, Phil's already starting. Phil from Trending in the AM. Thanks for tuning in, Phil. This is that Chief sweatshirt. Yeah, Phil, listen, I, I said the same thing to you even before we started. So it's just... It's Ryan. It's what he does. He he loves just, instead of wearing something on the NBA draft night, he decided to wear his NFL stuff just to rub it in a little bit more. But that's okay. We understand it. Well, a couple of things, Sandy, to kind of kick off, because you, in your podcast, and we talked a little bit here before we went on live tonight, is that when we all start, hopefully in, in our careers, in our livelihood, we try to figure out what's going to be kind of like our our passion, our values, what inspires us? What makes us just, you know, better all together? 
we also think about, you know, kind of seeing ourselves in, in a, in a broader picture, like what's our, again, what's our meaning, what's our worth. So I, I, I want to start out with going in relation to the Sandy Adams show. I, I want to go with, when you talk about maybe like reinventing yourself and, and there was a point in one of your shows when you talked about going back to 2017, which yes. I would love to know exactly what ended up happening there. But when you're reinventing yourself, what part of your life could you share with people that, you know, we all go through again, trials, tribulations, everything else, but how can we reinvent ourselves that we, if we just went through a bad life experience or we're just trying to make ourselves better, how do we do it? And then how do you overcome as far as when it came to 2017? So, you know, what I try to tell people and myself as well is you should never be committed to just a job. You should be committed to a calling or a passion or something like that. Because when you leave a job, a lot of times most people feel like they've lost all their value. And out of necessity, mine just became storytelling. Uh, when from, from when I was little, I didn't even realize that I just wanted to tell stories, whether that was through photography or through social media or through uh, writing or through videos or whatever it is. I just want to tell stories and tell stories about people. And that really was the, the top thing. When you're reinventing yourself, you just have to look at what your values are, what your passions are, and then figure out a way that you can do that, whether it is starting off doing it uh, for, you know, on the side as kind of a passion project, or if you're looking for volunteer work, uh, we can talk about that. I, I started off with American Heart Association. I'm a 23 year volunteer with them. And that be became a part of me. And so that I can take anywhere that the stuff that I've done with them. So it's really about that. And you talked about 2017. So we're going to start off kind of hardcore this time. <laughs> so my my mother passed away in 2016, in October of 2016. She had a 20-year battle with heart disease, which was originally the reason I got involved with the Heart Association. And then in early 2017, I went through a divorce. And I was living in Houston at the time. I was completely alone. I did not have any family there. I didn't have really any close friends. I'd been there for 12 years. I knew a ton of people, but I just didn't know them really well. And I actually didn't tell my brother or sister at all that what was going on um, until we had to go back to Tennessee and pack up my mom's house. And then um, I told them afterwards. And, and for me, it was just about starting, like I, I started completely from scratch, like no money, no job, nothing, no future, nothing. And so for me, it was really about um, looking at just taking a moment to say it's okay. You know, I don't have to know what's going to happen the next day. And then just getting up every day and trying to do some action. I had two dogs and a cat, thank God, because they got me out of bed every day, you know, um, and they've since passed away. But it was just really about getting up every day and taking action and trying to figure out you know, what it is you want to do next. And a lot of times, especially for women, they go through divorces in their 40s, in their 50s. And, you know, men do the same thing. And suddenly you don't know, like, you don't know what's coming next. You've got to reinvent yourself and you've got to figure out what it is that you want to do. And so now what I try to do is teach people to figure out that passion early and right. not tie it to a specific job at a company or a title is really what it comes down to. And I think it's one of those tough points because again, when you, when you go through a life changing event, it, it's really hard because everybody deals with everything differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the, the one tough aspect of our lives is just that if you, some people handle just like funerals, you know, some, some people when yes. after the passing of their loved one, some folks the very next day, they just act like, Hey, you know what? It's tomorrow. It's a new day. Right. I mean, they've right. passed. And then you have some people that grieve for months on end. And especially if it's somebody who's been together for 35, 40 years, yeah. you know, it's tough because you've, you've awakened with that person every day of your life and they're no longer there. So you hope that your friends, your support will be there. And the same way with people who deal with either drugs or alcohol, they finally get to a point in their lives where they want to change this. You know what? That's enough. I, I'm done. Right. I got to clean the act up and, and I've got to get better. So, you know, it's interesting the way you point out because uh, I think we all get stuck sometimes in our own little minds is saying, you know, 
can I do better? What can I do better for myself? You know, what can I refocus upon? Because once you go down a, a kind of a, a dark alley, not literally, but in your mind, you know, when there's nothing there you, in the sun shining and we That's have right. blue skies and everything else, it's extremely tough for some people because it's just that factor. Like, what's my purpose? What am I doing here? It, if, am right. I worth something? So it's a lot of emotions that a lot of people go through. I, I loved when you talked about it on your episode because it, you know, you're absolutely right. It's, it is tough. I think divorce is definitely one of those key factors up there, especially when you, cause you love and trust that person. And none of us in the end want to get divorced. You know, when you look at it, right. especially if you have kids, it, it's a really tough, you know, life lesson to go through. One but thing I that I do want to add to that is, um, you know, my ex and I, we did not get along. Like we should have broken up a long time before that. Right. But what I, I don't think that people understand is that it doesn't matter if you're in a great relationship or not. When it ends, you're losing a family. And for me, I lost two families within just a few months of each other. Whether it was a good environment or not, you're still, there's still that loss there. And so, you know, you do have to find a way to carry on. Um, I, I, been teaching for a nonprofit out of Houston for five years. And it was teaching job search to mid-level professionals. People have a college degree, a master's degree. A lot of people have PhDs. There were a lot of engineers that had lost their jobs uh, and were trying to figure out how to find a new job. And what I realized after just a month or two of teaching these classes was it wasn't about teaching them job search. It was about teaching them to see the value in themselves. You know, it's really hard when you have somebody sitting in front of you who has two patents to their name right. and are incredibly brilliant. And they're looking at you and saying, nobody, why would anybody want me? Why would anybody want to hire me? And, you know, I used to, I tell them a lot is that sometimes you, you have to appreciate when you go through these hard times because you get to reevaluate your life. When you get out of school and you get married, you get on this hamster wheel of life and you just keep going on it. And then suddenly you're what, 60, 70 years old and you're like, where did my life go? But for people that go through hard times, sometimes, and I'm not saying that you should go through those, but sometimes you have to look at it as it's another opportunity to find yourself again and to figure out what makes you happy. And I will say 2017 changed me completely because it made me more patient, but it also made me like, I get up, I choose to be happy now. Right. You know, I choose to look at things in a positive light. I still have bad days, but I still choose to be happy and choose to see the good. Right. So now it's, we flipped around, right? Cause now it's, you're talking about restoring your value because now right. it's where everything starts kind of going up. And then, which leads into your current career, as far as becoming vice president of the Memphis Rebounders, you know, dealing with, as far as with social media, you're, you're, as Brian said, Brian, and I'll let him say the second word <laughs> since he likes to <laughs> mess around with a little bit, but no, you know, it, it's it, then now coming into your career because for everybody, again, it, the career path that we all would like to take, it's not an easy one, especially when you're trying to, to figure right. out, you know, how much your worth is, what's that value. So lead us a little bit into, into your career there, the, the change, the upswing after 2017 to where you are today. So, you know, after 2017, I just decided I, I actually couldn't get a job. I, I have a master's in education. I'm certified in high school history and government. Nobody told me when I went to school I needed to coach a sport. Um, but I tried to get a job in, you know, I got my license transferred in Texas. I tried to get a job and no one would give me a job. Uh, my degree was too old. I didn't have any paid teaching experience. And so I decided to put my uh, my focus back into photography and really tried to push that again, which I did and I was very successful at. But I also, in the meantime, looked for paid teaching jobs because I never wanted to put myself in a position again where I didn't have that paid experience. Uh, and that's how I found the nonprofit and started teaching job search, which really, I love motivating people and I didn't realize that. And I had, you know, for all of my bad experiences in business and life, I actually could motivate them because if I could stand there in front of them and, and they could see I was okay now, it, it really inspired them to believe in themselves. Um, but it was in 
2019, it was actually in December, I was shooting a gala uh, in Houston. It was uh, on a Friday evening and all the guests were out there dancing and I, I'm taking photos of them dancing and they're having such fun. And I remember standing there and all of a sudden I just realized I'm watching people live their lives and I'm not living my life. I'm just going through the motions. And I realized at that moment, Houston was not where my heart was. It it wasn't where I wanted to stay. And so I made the decision then to move back to Memphis. I really missed it. And uh, I wanted to be closer back to friends and in, in the family that I had around in the area. And so uh, unfortunately, the pandemic hit, uh, but I had already planned to move back the pandemic hit. And I just went ahead and pushed through and, and came back. And it was in the fall of, because I moved back in the fall of 2020. And it was the next year that I wanted, uh, everything was starting to open up a little bit more. And I wanted to find out how I could get more involved in the Memphis community. And so I was just looking online and I saw this organization, the Memphis Rebounders, and it had, it's it been around since 1965. I'd never heard of it when I was in school. And so um, I, I just decided that it was I was just going to give it a try, you know, and uh, I went to the first event, which was called Happy Hour Hoops, and there were a lot of, of senior citizens there, and but it was so much fun, and and I just stayed more and more involved in it. I stalked the um, officers, that's what I like to say, is I stalked them, and they invited me to be on the board, and it is a voluntary position. Uh, they invited me to be on the board, and then um, this past summer, our vice president, uh, Kevin Wood, stepped down and, and I said, you know, I'd like to do it. Uh, so I stepped up and did it. And I already do social media. So I took that over last summer. And uh, I have a, you also have to have a history of, of Memphis basketball and kind of know that. And so I just uh, did it and, and really love it. I've met so many amazing people at games, at our events, and it's just, um, Memphis is a, is a big, small town. So that's, that's how, kind of how I put it. All right. Eric? You talked at the beginning mm -hmm. to, to go back about how your life should not be determined or all about work. And I, right. and I am of that similar mindset. I am not a what some may call like a workaholic or part of the hustle culture and stuff like that. I do value my own personal time rather than a uh, higher income if I were to work right. more and stuff like that. So I agree with you on that point, but I also just I, I just see on your um, – on your LinkedIn, I'm looking at it and stuff like that. And you're doing a lot. You're doing a lot of different stuff. You're volunteering with the American Heart Association. You're with the Memphis Rebounders. You're running your own own company with the San, uh, Sandy Adams Creative Group. I was just wondering, with all this volunteering and work that you have going on by running uh, essentially your own company, helping with nonprofits and helping with uh, booster clubs with the Memphis Rebounders, how do you separate your work? How is your work life balance? How do you set aside time so that your life so that you can live your life so that you're not just stuck in, in our same hamster wheel that you were talking about? Right. It's, it's been a struggle. And I will say that, um, the thing that I've kind of dealt with is I work, uh, I work out of my house and I live alone. So, you know, the isolation, especially from COVID, I think that that's really been hard for a lot of people. And that was one of the reasons why I did get involved with the rebounders. How do I set, how, and you know, I do do a lot of things, but like the heart association, it's only once a year. Uh, I do four, uh, two days of photo shoots for them. So it's, that's once a year. Um, and the rebounders like right now, I'm not doing anything until next month and then that'll kind of kick up. But the thing with that is, you know, a lot of those people have become my friends. And so with the rebounders, the work and the free time kind of, there is no division because, I really like those people. We have a group chat, our officers and executive board do, and they are just the funniest people. And we just really enjoy spending time together. But 
I also recognize that um, there are there are things that I need to do, you know, outside of work. There, I'm very good now about, and again, this has probably come from the pandemic. Was that, you know, I make sure that I go out and walk at least one to two miles every day, and I kind of do that to end my day um, because I'm one of those people that, you know, I love creating, and so a lot of times I will be on the computer 10, 11 o'clock at night still. And what I've found is, you know, by stopping myself and going to walk, that actually kind of ends my day. And so I, I've put in kind of some parameters that kind of force me to to switch that off. And I try not to work on the weekends and I try to go and, and do things that are fun and, and travel. So I am very well, well aware of that. Um, but I think also for creatives, it is hard. It is hard to kind of force yourself to do that. But I definitely keep having an open dialogue in my head about that. Sandy, again, thanks for coming on. You're um, welcome. It's kind of eerie the way our lives parallel one another. <laughs> <laughs> You're from a small town. I'm I am. from a little itty bitty town. You know, it's not bad to be itty bitty. No, and it's not. No, it's not. Said. So, um, I lost. So, right. Go ahead. I was going to say, where are you from? I grew up in a little town called Palmerton, Pennsylvania. I never heard of it. No, you ever hear of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania? Allentown, Pennsylvania? I have heard of Allentown, okay. yes. I'm about yes. 20 minutes north of Allentown. I have a, a cousin that lives in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. That's yes. about an hour north of where I was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, I lost both my parents within a seven month stretch of one another. It was from 2013 to 2014. Had I not had sports right. and music to immerse myself in, and the fact that my father, my father had heart disease, right. um, never really took care of himself. How did the photography aspect become so therapeutic for you? Actually, it wasn't the photography. Oh, okay. Um, for me, that paid my bills. Uh, but for me, you know, if you look back at 2017, Houston flooded in August. Mm -hmm. Hurricane Harvey came and flooded the entire city. I had water within five feet of my house for five days um, and couldn't leave. For me, it was, um, strangely enough, you know, we talked in the very beginning before we got on about, I, I actually like the Houston Astros now. <laughs> I never, ever liked baseball. I actually, I actually broke up with a guy one time because he was from <laughs> Chicago and he loved baseball so much. And it was funny because after it was the World Series, the 2017 World Series, and I'll never forget it was the fifth game. I just fell in love with, with I understood then the love of baseball. Um, I can't watch all the games, mm -hmm. but I kind of, and I even reached out to him and sent him an email and I'm like, I'm really sorry. I was so mean to you about that. Um, <laughs> But for me, it was, it, it strangely enough was the baseball and it was just um, not going out and just, I, I took a lot of um, weekend drives with my dogs and I just spent a lot of time with them and just going out and again, just being quiet, just being, you know, every day, just trying to go out and force myself to do something. Um, I wouldn't say the photography was as much about that. Um, but the travel was in just getting out um, road trips for me, whether they're two or three hours or a day or something are very therapeutic. I've always loved to do that. And um, so, yeah, it was, that was what really helped me and, and my, my friends that didn't live there um, talking to them quite a bit. And thank God for my cats too. They're yes. Like, right. Cats. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're nobody, they're, well, they're family members really. They are. Um, so they thank are. God for my two little cats that I had at the time. And um, that got me through it. And I see the smirk on Angel's face because <laughs> he's never heard me talk about my cats before. So. <laughs> I did have a cat too. I had a cat and two dogs. And they, they don't care if you're not in a good mood. They do no. not care. They want to be fed. They want to yeah. be walked. Mm -hmm. They don't care. Right. So, now, yeah. I, I will say, well, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to the cat thing here for a second. But Joey B, it's, it's been a while since we spoke to Joey B. Joey B is from Colorado, Sandy. Uh, always has great comments. Normally picks on somebody. But this time he says, uh, Miss Memphis, what up, David Roddy? Uh, yes. Colorado, see, looks, as, uh, looks good as a grizzly. He does look good as a grizzly. I think his last game uh, for the Grizzlies, he got called up really quickly at the end. I think he had like 42 points. 
for that game. I'm not a big NBA fan. I know everybody's going to like hate on me for that, but um, <laughs> I, I only have so much time and so much mind space for it. But uh, yeah, I, I, he is, he's very impressive. In case you're just tuning in, uh, Sandy Adams is joining us here, the vice president of the Memphis Rebounders. So you guys are listening on Sports Radio 102.9 FM, the game also on Amp Radio and over on BroadSCSouth.com. We appreciate you tuning in tonight. And Sandy, we talk about photography, and we'll get a little bit into, in, into some basketball talk as well, but photography, because everybody, it's probably one of the either relaxing, enjoying, and also at the same, at the same time too, when you're trying to create that perfect moment, there's some thought process that goes along with it. Sometimes you just point and shoot and everything, and it works out just fine. I would like to know, pardon me, I would like to know from when you've taken your pictures, is there a certain area or a certain maybe travel destination that you love to go to that you know you would either get the most, the best pictures or just memories so you can remember as years go by, like, oh, I remember this place, it was when I was in Texas or maybe out in Arizona. That That is a hard question because I have literally traveled so much over my life um, and so many road trips just, uh, and I'm always taking pictures. I will say that the one thing I always try to do, I always prefer smaller towns. I always prefer those back roads. But one of the things that I absolutely love is going into really old cemeteries uh, and looking at the tombstones and just looking at how they're how they're carved and the information on them. There's so much history, especially in the older ones. Um, you know, I've I've driven down back roads and seen, you know, little family plots that were listed in the 1700s or the 1800s. And and to me, um, it's it's just a lost part of America. And those people obviously have been forgotten because, because, you know, they've been buried for so long. But for me, it's just um, another piece of America that I don't think it gets seen enough. And I, my, strangely enough, people are probably wondering about that. Um, my mother actually grew up, uh, we, we lived in a really small town north of Jackson, Tennessee called McKenzie. And she actually grew up in, in a little two-room house behind the local cemetery. And so as a child, for me, um, we would go out there quite a bit because she had played out there when she was little. They had to walk through the cemetery to get to the street to get to school. And for me, it was just another part of it, um, especially the older cemeteries. And, and I have a history background. So for me, that's probably the thing that I love the most, no matter where I've gone, I'm always drawn to those old cemeteries and the old tombstones. Okay. We have a comment here, by the way, from Diana Garcia. And <laughs> that's my did, cousin. She yeah. lives in California. <laughs> <laughs> and she said it right there. Cause she said, love seeing Sandy talk about basketball and career advice, although I'm biased as her cousin. So yeah. She is. Um, Sam is actually, I had her on my podcast. So she's a couple of years older than me. She grew up in California, um, but her dad grew up in Tennessee. And so she used to come back for the summers. And uh, I, that's how we became so close with she would come back every summer and, and uh, we would hang out and stuff. So um, I call her, I uh, call her my twin cousin. So everybody's going to laugh, but it, it's not weird. A brother and a sister married a brother and a sister. So her grandparents and my grandparents are brother and sister. So we're double cousins. Uh, oh, wow. Nothing wrong with that. Like two separate, <laughs> two right. separate brother and sister. Um, and her, and her nickname is Sam. Her dad wanted a little boy. So when she was born, uh, he called her Sam. So that's the only thing I've ever known. Um, I know she's probably dying right now that I'm talking about her, but, but she's, re she's super cool and supportive. So uh, as Diane is here and I'm going to get the joy beast coming here in a second, but so is Diana, I'm wondering, Lakers fan or Golden State fan? No, she's not a basketball fan. She's a Giants <laughs> fan. Is she really? Yes. But as she says, I'm dead with the. <laughs> <laughs> she has the best sense of humor, I tell you, the best. Yeah, she's a Giants fan. Which but, Giants? Yeah. San Francisco Giants or New York Giants? San Francisco Giants. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She lives right. She lives right outside of uh, the Bay Area there. Okay. <laughs> and she follows it up with yes girl i feel like i'm on i'm being quizzed here <laughs> Mandy, no, real quick, just to, to stay in the photography part of everything yes i pulled up an interview and i should have wrote what the interview was but it says you quoted as saying photography is another avenue in telling a person's story 
-hmm. and you readily admit that Vogue and Vanity Fair, that's where you took your portrait style from. What about those two particular publications did you like so much? So um, growing up, my mom always had a movie camera in my face. Um, and so like my childhood is on Super 8 movies, uh, but she loved, it was it was the 60, late 60s and she loved Priscilla Presley and she loved, um, um, I can't think of, Princess Grace from Monaco. She loved them. And so she always, and my mom was a seamstress, so she sewed clothes and she made all my clothes. Um, and she always had these magazines and I loved the paparazzi style photos of them. Uh, I just, to me, especially the black and white, they were just really iconic photos. Vogue and Vanity Fair, and I guess you really want to talk about Annie Leibovitz, the famous uh, photographer. I loved, I loved the ads mostly uh, because it's such a combination of, I don't like those posed studio portraits. I've never liked that. I like um, most of my shoots are outside and I try to make it an experience, but I just love that the, the images uh, that somebody is somehow in action or they're more in their environment than, and just catching somebody like a paparazzi would. I, you know, there's a famous one of Jackie Kennedy where she's walking through New York and she's got the sunglasses on and, and her hair is kind of blowing about her face. Those are the portraits that to me, um, they just kind of tell the essence of somebody. You can just capture um, their personality a little bit or a moment in time of them and they're not trying to pose. Now, before I get to uh, Joey B's comment here, I'll read it momentarily. It's a good thing that that Neff there decided he wanted to bring up photography because a lot of people don't know this. But if Sandy, if you remember going back when when cameras were first started and you had to put the kind of the curtain over your head, yes, and you looked through the lens and then you stay there with a flash. So Ryan, going back to 1946, I don't want to age him, <laughs> but he would go back and he was the one that actually took the first the first selfie. So I just want to bring that up as uh, he doesn't share that much, but. Then he invented the Polaroid, so it, it's okay. And she, only, she only celebrates her birthday every four years, by the way. Wow, y'all have like been all over my <laughs> websites. You're, you are correct. I was born on Leap Day, so I only have a birthday every four years. You are correct. <laughs> That's a good thing. It's not bad. But Joey B says, Neff versus Sandy, Casey barbecue versus Memphis barbecue. Let's, let, uh, let's hear the debate. Well, I'm going to be honest. I don't think I've had uh, Kansas City barbecue. I've I had Kansas City barbecue sauce. <laughs> I, I probably, yeah, I have had that too, but I've never had Kansas City barbecue. No, I I've heard it's Kansas City. fantastic. Well, I'm sure it is. I'm sure. <laughs> the, the only sure, thing that, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you in the barbecue debate of the world is um, I don't like brisk, like I don't like beef barbecue. I'm all about the pork. Brisket. Um, so yeah. I actually never heard of brisket. And when I moved to Texas, never heard of it. <laughs> Somebody's like, we're going to smoke brisket. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and, and they're like, it's the cow. And I'm like, you don't barbecue cows. <laughs> uh, I didn't, I didn't understand that, but, um, but I mean, it's okay. If you have really good, it, it's can be good, but I, I just prefer pork barbecue. So I'll leave it at that. So it's any city's great. <laughs> All right. Eric, I don't know if you had a follow up. Yeah, I was just just talking about how you um you graduated college and you have a master's in teaching and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um both of my parents are teachers. They're uh they're uh, well my mom used to be a special ed kindergarten teacher. Wow. Now now she's an elementary uh, school librarian, so she still somewhat teaches. And my dad's been a first grade teacher for 30 plus years. Wow. And I was one, and it says here that like you have a teaching license in U S and world history. And I was wondering what is your interest in that? Why did you get a degree in, in, in teaching? I know you don't really, you're, you're not focused a lot in the world of teaching and stuff, but I still would like to know when getting your license, when getting your degrees, what about history connected with you? So I, I grew up really loving history. You know, I grew up in this really small town and um, I always laugh because I'm fascinated by the Middle East. Uh, I'm fascinated by the Middle Eastern cult culture and the history, specifically Egypt. And it really started, and everybody's probably going to be laughing about this, but I saw the movie, The Ten Commandments with Yul Brynner as Ramses when I was probably like five or six years old. And 
I was just obsessed with Ramses the Great, just absolutely obsessed. And I read like all the encyclopedias. I read everything about Egypt. And, um, you know, a lot of my classmates were reading Dr. Seuss. Well, my mom didn't like Dr. Seuss. I didn't know that. I didn't know what green eggs and ham or whatever was. Uh, and I, it was actually later in life uh, when I was getting my master's, I asked her why she never let me read those books. And she's like, I thought he was stupid. And I'm like, okay, I do too. Um, but I just had this love of Egyptian history and that just kind of followed me. And even in my undergrad, my concentration was the Middle East and Northern Africa um, for my international relations degree. But I actually started my master's in anthropology. I'd wanted to do archaeology. And at the time, Memphis didn't have an Egyptology program. They just had Egyptian art history. And I started in anthropology and I uh, on my second class, I had to go on a dig in Mississippi. It was like 40 <laughs> degrees in this cornfield. And they made me shift, uh, sift dirt literally for eight hours. And I was like, this, I'm not doing this. I don't look like I belong in these classes. And so I, I'd always wanted to teach in some type of museum setting. So uh, I switched to education and uh, switched to history and did not nobody and and I did my student teaching in Europe. I went to Germany for two weeks and England for four weeks and did the, the my six week portion of my student teaching, and then applied for the city school system and and literally the ladies laughed and said we don't have a position for you. If you could coach a sport, we could get you in. <laughs> and I was like, I spent five years of my life getting a degree that I can't get a job because I don't coach, which is kind of ironic now. But um, but that's kind of how I got into it. But I still. Even though I'm not teaching history now, I did um, I did teach a history of the blues uh, for a small college in uh, Texas, um, but I still like there's still things that I do about it. When I was in Houston, I uh, volunteered for a archaeology. Uh, group. They focused on education. I got to meet archaeologists from all over the world that would come in for our talks. And I was just, for me, that was just, uh, if I can't do it, then at least I can join them. So for me, you know, I still do those things. Um, I do genealogy and, and that's, um, that gives me a little bit of that, you know, history flavor a little bit. So, yeah. Would you consider after all, after you've felt like you've succeeded in the landscape that you're in right now. Would you ever think about possibly going and maybe using your, the teaching degree to teach at a uh, history at like a community college or something? I like would that? love to teach at a community college. I would love to teach at a major university. Um, the thing that they don't tell you about my degree is that you can't teach history unless you have a master's in history. Mm, okay. I can't teach education which I have a master's in because you have to have a PhD. So, oh, okay. uh, so it, yeah, it's, it's all these weird things, but yeah, I would, I would love to uh, pick up a class or two. I still love it. Um, I just realized, uh, you know, through the years that I don't necessarily want to teach high school cause I don't want to teach in that structure. And, uh, there's a lot of politics involved and I say that overall, and I've got tons of friends who are teachers are probably hating me right now, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, like it's, yeah. My parents would definitely agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Angel, I'm going to put her on the spot here. Uh oh. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Better stretch the Derrick Rose Memphis years or the Keith Lee Memphis years? <laughs> that's <laughs> uh -huh. um, that's going to be a hard one. Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> I wasn't living in Memphis when Keith Lee was playing, so. Um, I, and I wasn't living in Memphis when Derrick Rose went that, uh, that whole thing. I wasn't in Memphis for either one of those, uh, for those teams. Uh, but yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. I don't, I can't answer that. <laughs> and I know members of that team, they're going to, they're probably watching me going, Oh my God, I can't believe she's not saying. So I will say, because I do know members of that team, I'm going to say that the, the 2018. Okay. Yeah. All right. Again, I'd like to thank everybody who's listening on Sports Radio 102.9 FM, The Game, here stateside internationally. We thank you, the listeners, for always tuning in. We do appreciate it. We are live here every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Used to be at 8, but we switched over to 9 p.m. because of the show prior that I do at 7. This week, there was no show at 7 o'clock. So, uh, again, 
And if you like basketball, tune in tomorrow as the Basketball League will be live at 8 p.m. It is Potawatomi Fire against the St. Louis Griffins. So you guys can tune in tomorrow and listen to that as well. But Sandy, you, you part of, of, of what you do, we'll, we'll get into your, your brand. Uh, what was that word again, Ryan? That you, you strategize. <laughs> strategize. <laughs> there you go. But no, as we you know, we talked about the travel. You and and Eric kind of uh, skirted around the question there a little bit too, as he, he interjected with something else. But with, within your travels, mm-hmm. where would you say is probably the most unique destination just to date? Not not you know as far as in the future or anything else, but today, oh. what was your most unique travel destination? Again, that's a hard one. Um, I'd probably pick, you know, when I was in Europe, um, that to me was really amazing. I have uh, Scottish ancestry and going into Scotland, uh, I didn't, um, my, my ancestors are not from the mainland, but, um, just going there and walking on that land to me was kind of, I don't want to say spiritual, but it was, it was really uh, interesting and in, in being in that. But I'll also say I went to um, outside of um, in New Mexico, uh, outside of Taos, there's a Taos Pueblo Indian Reservation there. And I went there and that was pretty incredible. The The dwellings that are there are literally thousands of years old. Uh, and that was pretty incredible. But there's, there's so many places that I've been. Montana, Wyoming. Uh, I never thought I would like Wyoming, but that was just an incredible state. Yellowstone. Uh, again, I never thought I would like it and got there and it was just awe-inspiring to me. And uh, as far as the brand strategy, right? Because as a strategist, it, it makes it tough when you're trying to Figure out how not only to guide people, but when you start yourself, because everybody knows when you deal with social media, it, there's a lot of things with what people do is with trends. Now, you could be a trend follower. You could also be a trend setter if you'd like to be. But either way, a lot of people need a little bit of guidance because it's not the easiest thing in the world if you're trying to grow your brand. And I think where a lot of people get caught up is, they may see other maybe TikTokers, TikTokers that are out there and trying to just come up with their own little thing, or they might follow somebody else or copy somebody. But when you're talking about being a brand strategist, it, a lot of the social media aspect of it comes into play. So what would you share with people who are just trying to define what is my brand and how can I get it off the ground floor and make it just run for everybody to understand what's it going to take for me to get to where my destination point is? So you really have to understand who it is that you serve. Like, who is the person that you serve? And I was listening uh, to a podcast a few weeks ago, and and they kind of explained it really well. You serve the person that you were. That's who you serve, generally. Um, You serve what you know. And, you know, the trends are great and everything, but it's social media and and growing a brand on there is about education uh, because there are four aspects. You know, first, people have to see you in order to remember you. And the more people see you, because that means you need to be consistent. You need to show up on social media on a consistent basis. And the more people see you, the more they know you. The more they know you, the more they like you. The more they like you, the more they trust you. And the trust factor is where they start to buy from you. And it's not about, you know, a lot of a lot of businesses, especially restaurants and stuff, they put out sales all the time. Right. It's just like watching a commercial then and people are going to get numb to that. But if you educate people and you educate them on what you do, then they're going to start coming to you for more information. They're going to start coming to you because they're they are interested in what you have to say. And so it really comes down to 80% education and 20% sales. Um, But you can't sell to somebody on the first call or the first post. You can't say, hey, buy this, buy this course or, hey, buy the subscription or, um, hey, I'm going to be doing this uh, consulting business or something like that. You've got to build up that trust and you've got to educate people on what you do. Um, When I started my photography business, I didn't have any clients, and at, at that time, I didn't. Nece- I, I didn't necessarily understand. Uh, I didn't want to be 
the face of my company. But what I realized was there are thousands of photographers out there. People aren't buying the photography. They are, but they aren't. And I'm not the best photographer. I'm also not the worst photographer. But you have to, they're going to, they're going to hire you, the person and the experience that you offer. And so what I realized early on was I had to create something for me. And if we talk about building a brand for me, that was how do I set myself apart from everybody else? In Houston, there I live south of Houston. There were two large studios there. I don't, I didn't want to shoot portraits in a studio. Um, so what I did was I leaned into that Vogue and Vanity Fair, the cover shoots, going out on location. I didn't have a studio, so it was also out of necessity, but I started creating and I also started making these behind the scenes videos. Uh, Vogue had been doing that with their cover shoots. They would make behind the scenes videos, put them up on YouTube. And I was like, they can do it. I can do it. And so I started doing that and I really started branding myself as this magazine style experience. I'm not for everybody, but I'm for someone. And it's strange as it was, I did, you know, I went out and got my friends and shot them because people don't buy what they can't see. So right. you have to show what you want to sell. And I started with every shoot, I started blogging about them and I started writing stories. And the stories were, you know, maybe I described that day or what was going on with the weather and things like that. And, and then told a story about how that all came about. And instead of just saying, Hey, here's some senior shots. She just graduated or something like that. I, I tried to make it more of a story and the stories really just started taking off. You know, that's an important part too, because when you're building a brand and I think a lot of people, as you said, you know, consistent, you brought up also one of your podcasts as well. Did you have to be consistent all the time? Yes. It, it's tough because, so you have some people it, and, and what people tend to forget is once you get ready to start your brand, mm -hmm. don't go off as much as people like to do when it comes to the social media aspect, because again, those are just trends for the moment. That's right. You have to figure out who you are. The consistency, especially when you're doing a podcast, is the most difficult part of it because it you do have to come up with a different topic. You just can't go off the same topic. You also can't copy and paste, you know, paste from an ESPN or your local radio show. You can you can do all the research you want to and then come up with your own content. So people understand, like, okay, I'm not listening to ESPN version two. It's right. you know, it's how you come across your brand. When it comes to podcasting, the tough part is because there is a lot of research behind it. You have to make sure that what you are stating, you're stating facts. They're sure. just not coming up with something that's just completely out of the blue. So as people evolve, and we see now with chat GBT, we see now with AI. I mean, right. now we don't know sometimes that we can have someone on the show. We hope that it's a human being. But at the rate that we're going here, with, with, again, with brand strategies, and I think it was a, a an actual station out in California where they had an AI DJ next to an actual DJ. Wow. So when you're talking about building a brand, that's the scary part now because you want to put all your hard work into it, but now someone can just come up with an AI version of you and spin off of what you're doing. So, you know, strategize as far as your brand, you got to make sure when you're out there doing a consistent thing, whether it be in a podcast, a photo shoot, right. if it's, it's a sale marketing that you're doing, you're absolutely right with the consistency. Believe in what you're doing. And when That's you right. sell to somebody, don't do it like a used car salesman. Like, hey, Eric, I see you're walking in the parking lot. You know, can I interest you in this engine? I'm not buying the engine. I want to buy the mm -hmm. car. Yeah, but take a look at this engine. So there's different aspects and elements when you're building the brand. And you hit it on point because I was going to circle back to your, your one episode as you talked about. You know, it's, it is that consistency factor. Right. A lot of people start off, they may do it for five or six episodes. They might, you know, take a few pictures. And then once you get away from social media, the hardest part is you start to lose your audience. You start losing yes. the consumer because you're not being consistent. And that's one thing, no matter how many times you may view something on YouTube or something else, that's where people miss that keyword is that consistency. That's right. And so I'm, I'm glad you brought it up and a great explanation from it because it is true. One thing when building your brand, you do have to remain consistent. 
You got to be seen all the time where people out of sight is out of mind. And that's, I think that is the biggest thing. If, if instead of saying consistent out of sight is out of mind, if they don't see you, they're not going to remember you. And that, that is for anything. It's for people looking for a job. It's for people trying to market themselves, anything uh, out of sight is out of mind. Yep. Angel, am I supposed to be worried about this AI talk with like hosts and co-hosts? Are you are you are you going to replace me with an AI guy? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, no, but, is that what you're trying to get at? No, but you know it's funny because Sandy just said now that you know out of sight, out of mind. Dallas called; they want to know when you're coming back into their site because they don't mind that you're out of there. So it's a great point by Sandy there. But no, I'm not replacing you. It, it's it's a scary world though. You really think about it. I mean, they're going to have to control at one point or another when it comes to AI because. Who's to say? I mean, it, we've seen now, like, what is it? Uh, Shaq, he took away. So they used to do voicemails on Amazon. You could purchase it for, I think it was like oh, that's right. Yeah. Or something like that. And they've all taken it away because now, you know, you don't know. I mean, you're hoping right. that when people call you and you're speaking to a company somewhere, you're actually physically talking to a human being. And so it's, it is a very, very scary part of the world where we're going into now because you just don't know. The worst part, or at least maybe the great part is, if you are single and you're going out there to date somebody, you know there's a human <laughs> there. But if the person says, hey, I can only see you over the phone, and then so you might be talking to somebody versus AI. So it, it's a it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. Eric, you had something here to, to follow up with here before we end the show. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your book writing process and how, how that goes. So the book is actually a planner. Um, okay. Uh, that was, that was, I still have, I do have a book I'm working on. Um, back in 2010, I, uh, my ex and I uh, kind of took a little break and I took my one-year-old puppy. She was a Rhodesian Ridgeback. And oh. uh, my whole plan was to go to my brothers in uh, Nebraska. And I ended up doing uh, 15 states in six <laughs> weeks. Um, traveled over 8,000 miles, uh, just me and her. And um, I've been working on telling that story, um, because it was one, it was, um, trying to find myself again, trying to find, um, what joy I had. And I guess you could say that that's, I have a, another brand called a Southern girl's view. That's, um, my travel site that I have. And that was really about just kind of my view of the world and, and what was interesting about that is um, that was back when Facebook kind of really was starting to take off. And I started posting pictures um, while I was on the road. And I had people from high school that I hadn't talked to in a while. And they started following me. And they started, you know, thanking me for posting the pictures because I was seeing things in our country that they probably never would ever see. And for me, that really started that trying to see a different perspective. So when I went to a place, you know, a lot of times when you go to, to something that's um, famous or, you know, eye catching, you, you want to just look at it. Uh, I tried to go around and look at different perspectives. And um, I'll, I'll never forget, I was in uh, Scotland and I went to uh, Edinburgh Castle, Edinburgh Castle. And James the first who wrote, um, who wrote the new Testament, he was actually James the sixth of Scotland. His mom was queen, uh, queen Mary of Scotland. And she gave birth to him in this small little room in the castle. And I remember standing in that room and there is an opening because obviously you don't have glass windows. There was an opening and you're looking out on the city of Edinburgh. And I didn't take a picture of the room. I took a picture of the window looking out into Edinburgh because it's just, that was what she saw when she looked out that window, obviously in the 1500s. So I always try to look at different aspects of things. Um, but, and I forgot your question. So I hope I answered it. <laughs> Angel, just real quick before we leave. And we never talk basketball. <laughs> Sandy, what's the word around Memphis? Where do Kendrick Davis and Kale go? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> and that's why you brought it up. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't. Uh, I know that uh, that Kendrick uh, tried out for quite a few teams. Uh, I know he tried out for the Memphis Grizzlies as well, worked out with them. Uh, I don't know. I hope that they both go someplace great, and I hope that they get uh, contracts. Uh, love to see them uh, succeed at the next level. 
Now, Sandy, you did break some news the other day. I don't know if you want to share it out with everybody today, but you did do a breaking news about two days ago. Would you like to share with everyone what the breaking news was? I don't remember the breaking news. Can you give me a hint? (laughs) Sure. It's the, the fifth quarter. Oh, oh, I'm like, what breaking news? Um, so, so membership has its privileges in the Memphis Rebounders. And I met um, one of our former basketball players, Michael Wilson. He played for the Harlem Globetrotters for 10 years. And he reached out to me. Um, I ran, uh, we did uh, with the social media, we did a couple of, um, uh, during the summer, we did some videos from old players uh, doing a shout out for the new season. And Michael was one of those. And I connected with him on social media and we met um, at Lorenz and Wright's Jersey retirement ceremony back in February. But uh, about a month and a half ago, he reached out to me and he's like, what do you do exactly? Like, I see, I see you on social media, but what, tell me about it. So we're talking and he's like, I would like to start a podcast. He's writing his autobiography. It's called My Fifth Quarter and uh, talking about um, athletes and his specifically about how his life changed when he decided to stop playing sports. And he's like, you know, I'd love to do a podcast. Would you be interested in doing it with me? And I was like, I would love that because obviously I love basketball and I love the story and I love interviewing people. And and I do see the aspects of athletes, whether they agree to end their career or not, whether it's college or high school or or pro, um, they have a transition period and it's not always easy. It's not an easy path. And I see a lot of these, you know, everyday former pros who don't know what to do next, you know? And uh, he said that during the pandemic, a lot of uh, him and a lot of the Globetrotters that he had played with were having weekly Zoom calls and some of them were struggling with that. They didn't know what to do next. And and so we decided that we wanted to share their stories. And obviously we're starting with some of the old Memphis players. I say old, but former Memphis players. And um, several of his Globetrotter friends have already reached out and said they would love to be on it. And, and we've even had some of his military friends reach out and said they want to talk about what it's like to come back from, you know, overseas and get out of the military and try to transition into regular life. But I think it's a conversation that needs to be had, especially after the pandemic and and really mental health being such a huge conversation coming out of COVID. Um, but I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, a lot of these guys, I grew up knowing who they were and never got to meet. So I'm excited about that. So it'll be coming out. We'll be launching it uh, probably mid-June, July, early July. Yeah. We've already recorded one episode, so Michael's my first guest, so I'll go ahead and share that. And then we'll both be co-hosting together, so uh, that should be interesting. I've never co-hosted with somebody before. Well, very nice, and congratulations. That, that's Thank you. Cool. I Thank want to make sure you got the breaking news out there. And the final yes. thing will be to make sure you let everyone know where they can find you on social media and to share out your brand as well. Yes. So you can find everything about me at sandy-adams.com, but on Instagram, I'm official Sandy Adams. And on Twitter, I am at Sandy Adams underscore CO. And I don't really, I show up on Facebook, but not really. So. And this last tidbit of information for those who've been listening on sports radio, 102.9 in the game, also over on amp radio, brought us south.com. Fun fact, the only founding or last team member, I should say, of MySpace and Blockbuster is my own co-host, Ryan F. So I'll leave that with you guys tonight as an afterthought. But nonetheless, Sandy Adams, thank you so much for joining us here Thank tonight. you. Thank you Eric, very much. Ryan and my producer over on Studio B, we thank you all for tuning in to Broad Street South. We will see you all next week. Enjoy your weekend. Strategize. <laughs> <laughs>